Today, Crypto goes on his tirade of not knowing Philip K. Dick and then looking up how many of his favorite movies he's written. <laughs> okay, I, I, I gotta grab my phone because I was not, I, I, I didn't know this. Did you know, I mean, I've heard his name. He's pretty big in the world of sci-fi and stuff, but just a little sampling of things that have been his works turned into film, uh, The Man in the Castle High, The Adjustment Bureau, Next, A Scanner Darkly, Paycheck, Minority Report, Screamers, one of my all-time favorites, Total Recall, and considered to be like the creme de la creme masterpiece of a single sci-fi movie by many, Blade Runner. b Whoa, what a list. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just want to say thank you for Star for suggesting this, as this is our uh, Patreon read of the month. So thank you, thank you, thank you. This was fun to finally delve into uh, Philip K. Dick's repertoire of stories. I've been wanting to get to uh, this particular book by him called The Divine Invasion, and I don't know why I haven't read it. I just... I've literally had it in my Amazon wish list since 2003, I want to say. It's it's been a Dude, long time coming. Did Amazon exist in 2003? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was I'm OG baby. I am OG. Wow. So, this is a story where Earth sees a fission explosion on a planet far away. Like they kind of know that the planet's dead in a sense. They're, they're sending a ship out there to investigate is kind of the idea, right? Right. And the fly the crew fly by. And they're like, oh, hey, look at this planet. It looks like it's dying. <laughs> Get shot down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you said hey. it was abandoned. What's going on here? <laughs> Nothing ever happens bad when you're flying through space minding your own business. <laughs> no, nope. no, nope. no. Nope. Never saw that one coming. So they crash land and they're like, who could have shot us? This whole world is supposed to be dead, like extinct from this fission explosion, if you will. And they inspect the area, which might be an old farm. And they see these old white stones in the distance, the area from which they had been shot. And uh, they head out to inspect the dead city. Send down right? the red shirts. Yeah, send, <laughs> send them out. So they find an inscription in the area called Franklin Apartments, which I was like, wait a minute. They speak English on this planet? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> but they also find yeah, the mechanism. It can't be Ben Franklin, right? Or what? <laughs> well, well, first of all, why is it in English? That was my first question, right? Because aliens. Yeah, right. Yeah. Just saying. So they find this mechanized gun <laughs> that had shot down their ship and they decide to look for what was the gun guarding, right? Like the old myth of the dragon guarding the cave. Like I was kind of like the treasure. I was like, dang, Dick, you putting in like your own like analysis into your own story. That's bold. <laughs> Leave something for us, guy. <laughs> yeah, geez, man. So they enter this vault with the documentation of their culture, their art, et cetera, et cetera. And they talk about whether they should take the treasure now or later. And the captain of the ship dies when they return. It's exciting. And they break the planetary defense gun so they could take off. They fix their own ship and leave. And um, talk about one day returning to retrieve the treasures and re regain the culture. As they leave, a minecart comes up from the center and little robots come out and start fixing the gun. <laughs> the end plot. <laughs> I like that little twist at the end. I was not expecting that. That that was a little bit of out of left field for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, it gave me. Um, do you remember Ray Bradbury's "The Rains Will Come"? The salt. The rains will come softly. I think it is the the soft. Oh yeah, yeah. The house that repairs itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great story. It gave you this feeling of like you know humanity in that story, and based on a poem, humanity would destroy itself, but nature would move on. Right. The old uh, Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park tirade. Like, yeah, <laughs> like you can't really destroy nature in a sense. It's like, well, <laughs> well, this nature this kinda, will just change. This kind of gives you that same feeling where the robots come out and they're fixing the gun. And it kind of gives you this feeling of like a cyclical nature of things in a sense. Yeah, I thought it was very odd how that we're seeing the 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 nature of robotics repeat itself or technology come back and repair itself. And so I didn't know, was this story tech versus nature? Is that what uh, Dick was going here for this story uh, in, in that cyclical motion? I, I don't know. It's interesting here. So I wrote in my note, I'm going to read my note as, as it's written here. It says, did humans kill other humans and then only robots remained? Or was there a war between humans and machines won and thus the machines are just fixing the gun and protecting their planet let me just do a hard stop there and get your reaction on that i think that doing a little research on philip k dick you realize that he was a little bit anti 
technology slash ad, uh, automation. Like he didn't really trust, you know, the machines and technology moving forward. So I think he's probably, in my interpretation, knowing that about him, it's that the machines destroyed us because the machines do shoot down the spaceship. So, well, that was going to be my, my point is that I was like, well, I wrote humans here, which is almost kind of like a self fulfilling prophecy. Because if we do talk about the cyclical nature about how the machines are rebuilding the gun, what if this just keeps happening over and over again? Like this gun, this flash, which maybe it appears like an ex a fission explosion. I don't know. But what if it's this treasure, the Franklin apartments, et cetera, et cetera? What if this is always people coming to visit this area and they just keep getting shot down and down? And like as a result, it's just machines just taking the treasures and the culture and the remnants of what they're shooting out of the sky, basically, which is humans stupidly coming to investigate over and over again. So with that, do you think that it is... Because we've seen this in sci-fi tropes before. Maybe this is where they got the idea is that Earth is a mess and humans live on the moon or another planet or in a space station and they're going back to Earth, but they don't know it's Earth anymore. And that's where we keep this cycle going again. In all honesty, I, I mean, who knows... Who knows what Philip K. Dick was going after, right? Maybe a, a Dick specialist will tell us what exactly <laughs> was expected here. But um, for me, it, it, I, I come back to that this was written in 1952. And there's not enough textual evidence to be like, oh, he was for sure writing about the Cold War, right? But this is theoretically Cold War literature, right? This came out in, in it. And during the Cold War, you had a lot of paranoia, right? And we see that with how the crew didn't really know who was going to take charge if the captain were going to die. Like there's all this paranoia about who's really in control, who's really in charge. You have these weapons of mass destruction, right? This fission explosion that goes off that destroys the whole planet. This gun that just, you know, is just unmanned and taking or unaliened and taking down people as they fly by it. There's a lot of feelings of Cold War literature, whether he meant for it to be a commentary on it or not. It's in here. I have a little bit of a long quote that I think supports that from the text. It says, there must be hundreds of guns like this one. There must have been used in the site, guns, weapons, uniforms. Probably they accepted it as natural thing, part of their lives, like eating and sleeping. An institution like the church and the state, men trained to fight, to lead armies, a regular profession, honed, respected. And to me, that sounds very much like an ideology of like American ideology versus communist USSR ideology. Mm, interesting, interesting. I hadn't picked up on that one. Now, there clearly is war commentary, right? Because we have that comment. I mean, it's very minor, but he does say, do you suppose that they fought with each other? Perhaps they couldn't imagine anyone being friendly under any circumstances. What a strange evolutionary trait. Interspecies warfare, fighting within the race. How ironic. <laughs> <laughs> so if yeah, this... I mean... It, go ahead. I was going to say, if this really is war commentary, it is certainly a satiric look at it, at least. Oh, yeah, he's he's definitely poking fun. And I, I, I love that he's kind of able to do that. Because, again, is it is is it fighting within the race if you're fighting yourself? And are these people finding their ancestors on this planet? Yeah, well, it's a fun it's a fun story, right? And there's really interesting comments in here, right? Where there's like the quotes about how metal doesn't need to breathe air, right? And they also talk about how he's, you know, Dorle has seen ruined cities, but they died of old age, old age and fatigue. And that's a really interesting way to kind of anthropomorphize a city, right? Like the city died of old age. So so this is clearly in the realm of, of humanity, aliens, of living species impact on the environment and how it interacts with that environment. I don't know if it's a versus thing, but it definitely does have that. The rains will come softly commentary of, well, nature's going to be around regardless of whether the species populating it or not. You think it's a little bit of a play on the value of life as well. I, I got a little bit of vibe of that from it. I could see that. All right, let me bring up one more question here. There is commentary here about them wanting to leave with the art, with basically artifacts of their culture, the alien culture. What are your thoughts about looking at, like if you were to 
forgive me. If you're to, if you're to, if you're to win the lottery and move away, we never knew what happened to you. Let's let's do a little bit happier. And we go to oh, your okay. house yeah. and we're trying to figure out what kind of a life did crypto leave, right? Like live. And we looked around your house. We looked at all of your products, all your items. What kind of a story would that tell? Like if you if you've ever like looked around your house and like I even like look at my room, my studio, you have these lights and it's just like, "Well, what did he do with these things?" Like it's kind of interesting like how you can view art as a a story of of a peoples if you will i think this is that idea of right that if there's an apocalyptic event and you go in and you don't know the pers purpose of items especially technological items that don't work anymore it's going to be very confounding and you know you look back and you're like why does he have these little things that look like they should function and but they just seem like they're a child's toy or, uh, you know, why, why is the house set up or designed this way? And why do they have multiple places to um, sit down in a toilet that probably doesn't have water anymore? I, don't, I, think, I think a house itself would tell a very interesting story. Mine specifically would tell that uh, I'm messy and nerdy. <laughs> well, it's one of those things, too, that like, you look at all the stuff in here. Like, let's say you take a person from 100, 200 years ago. And you're just like, look at like the quality of life that we have now. Don't you think they would kind of like look at us like the alien species? Like, why would you guys ever fight? Like, this is amazing. All the stuff that you guys have, the comforts, the science, the technology. Like, isn't it interesting to like look around and we take for granted all the stuff that we have. But you could take someone totally out of water 100, 200 years ago and you can show them this and they'd think we were living like gods. You'd think, wow, this really is ridiculous that people would go to war. Like, look how good life is. I don't know. I just thought it was kind of interesting to think about what would our environment, our products tell from a story to an outsider? The only thing that would probably recognize is books, right? I mean, everything else would just be crazy. Plastic, lights, TVs, chairs, desks that are made out of these items. I mean, they would get nothing except for the books. That's the only thing that they would probably be able to fathom. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of ironic, isn't it? Like, my story would be like every, like like the people are here checking out like, whoa, what's this world like? And if, if they came in here at like, like Thursday at 6.59, all of a sudden all these little robots start coming out and they start turning on all my little lights and they turn on the lights in the background and they're like, oh, this guy must have done a lot of interesting lighting stuff between 7 and 9 p.m. on Thursday nights. Like <laughs> <laughs> lighting stuff, I love it. That's what we're going to refer to our recording sessions from here on out, lighting stuff. <laughs> yeah, we turned on the lighting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, little robots, turn off my lights. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we enjoyed this story. I thought it was pretty fun. What did you guys think of it? Let us know your comments down below. Uh, my name's been Una, and if you've enjoyed this, make sure you hit that subscribe button to join us on the journey. Thank you again, Star, for recommending this story. We really appreciate it. Peace. Peace out, guys. <laughs>